My name is Prasad Kadambi. I'm the immediate past chair of the Risk-Informed Performance-Based Principles and Policy Committee, RP3C, we call it. I want to welcome everybody to this next presentation in the series of Community of Practice webinars. The purpose of these webinars is to offer practitioners of concepts and methods related to risk-informed and performance-based approaches, RIPB we call them, a chance to share their knowledge and experience. I would expect that such practice is used to implement nuclear technology and evaluate its safety. The RP3C of ANS has been putting on these events for the past three years, and presentations and recordings are available on the ANS website under the tab RP3C. There are now over 40 such recordings available. The purpose of RP3C is to help modernize ANS standards. The Nuclear Energy Innovation and Modernization Act, NEMA of 2019, associates modernization with application of RIPB approaches. There's growing realization within the nuclear community that the com conventional prescriptive and deterministic approaches are not going to support increasing use of nuclear technology to play its rightful role for the benefit of society. Socializing alternative approaches could drive changes in industry and regulatory practices. ANS offers the COP files on its website to serve as a knowledge repository of the experience from a wide range of practitioners in the field. We hope that more people will use this knowledge base to speed up needed changes in the state of the art as well as the state of practice. I'm really excited today to hear from Chanson Yang, uh, and the concept uh, that his company, Radiant, uh, is, is uh, promoting and uh, uh, deploying, uh, we hope. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is the sort of thing that uh, we have tried to encourage, and um, we'd like more developers to come forward and share what they can with us on this. So... Uh, I'd like to get started. Chanson, please uh, go ahead and start your presentation. Thanks, Prasad, and thanks, Pat, for inviting us here today. Uh, super appreciate the patience in getting us scheduled. I think we had a, a few attempts at doing this a bit sooner, but wanted to make sure we provided um, some information that was going to be useful to everyone and, and had ample time to provide value. So, uh, as mentioned, my name is Chanson Yang. I work as the head of regulatory engineering here at Radiant Industries. The regulatory team, as I'm sure all of you can guess, is responsible for authorization. Uh, we are currently working towards a demonstration at Dome at Idaho National Lab through uh, the National Reactor, the Nuclear Reactor Innovation Center, so NREC. Um, working with INL, working with the DOE, we've got a couple milestones I'll highlight here. Uh, after we get through Dome, which it will be a demonstration of our reactor technology, the regulatory team is going to be responsible for the commercial application for Kaleidos. And that's what you see in that image right there is uh, a single Kaleidos reactor in a potential application. So we will pursue commercial licensing. Uh, we're looking for a manufacturing license and all of the other licenses that will be required, operating licenses, et cetera, to, to allow factory, factory fueling, checkouts and testing, and then eventual deployment with customers. I'll talk about that timeline a little bit on some other slides, um, but just a bit of an intro to the presentation. As Prasad mentioned, it's fairly quick, or at least the, the number of slides is fairly straightforward. Um, we, as a company, were founded in 2020. We're still a fairly young company. We have approximately 50 people. We're a Series B startup raised in, on the order of 40 to $50 million. 
Um, we are developing that initial Kaleidos demonstration unit for demonstration with the Department of Energy. <clears throat> but you can imagine basically our, our uh, timeline and our overall progress. So the content you're here is not going to be similar in nature to previous presentations where maybe we go into a high level of detail uh, or uh, great detail with how to pursue a certain approach um, and making a basis for that in past publications or uh, materials and, and rulings. What you'll instead see is more a need for a risk-informed environmental process. So <clears throat> sorry to anyone that's looking for a solution here, but definitely wanted to paint the picture of why uh, these changes are important and the types of uh, problems that we'll be addressing by enabling this technology. Uh, so let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. And I'll give a brief overview about <clears throat> Radiant as a company and what our product is. So Radiant is developing the Kaleidos micro reactor. It is designed to be transportable over the road via air. We have a lot of design requirements that center around those kind of principles. And so we are, are really aiming for uh, a transportable unit to replace diesel generators. <clears throat> and that is the aim of this product line is any of those locations where you would normally use a diesel generator for emergency power or for backup power, standby power, uh, we want to be able to provide a cleaner solution, uh, cleaner solution to diesel. We also want to eliminate those long supply chains, those refueling. So some of the benefits are, uh, I mentioned the clean aspect. I think everyone here is aware of that, but <clears throat> also the refueling aspect. So if you're operating a diesel generator at full tilt, you are refueling very frequently. And you'll see on this chart right here, it's actually two hours if you're operating a hundred percent. Depends on the overall capacity of the, the unit you're using, but, <clears throat> but definitely not uh, on the order of four to six years, which is our refueling cycle for Kaleido. So we drop off a reactor, uh, we activate it, it is generating power. And uh, in our model, this would be remotely operated, remotely monitored, would be load following capabilities. Essentially, it's uh, lights out. You don't have to think about power. You just know that in a couple of years time, we're going to pick it up, take it off site, refuel it out of our factory, and uh, you can continue to have power. You don't need to worry about ongoing maintenance with a diesel generator, uh, weekly refuelings, transporting fuel over the road back and forth, uh, and again, the uh, emissions associated with that. The aim is uh, the power output of about one megawatt electric. So again, that's aimed to be more or less a direct replacement for some of these diesel generators specific models. Uh, that's also so that we can size all of the components, the shielding and uh, the power generation to be in a single package that we can transport over, over the road. Again, thinking about shielding requirements and uh, radiation exposure. <clears throat> um, I think we go into a little bit more detail on the next slide. So I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go ahead and move on to slide number three. What you're seeing here is a cutaway view of the reactor. So from the left side, you've got the reactor core itself, the associated shielding, and then the primary loop with the helium circulator and our primary heat exchanger. So our coolant is helium. We are a high temperature gas reactor. Uh, it's the benefits of not having, um, not ha having a much safer event in case of a loss of coolant accident. You're not having radionucleides transported by the helium gas. Uh, the gas is vented. The core can passively cool itself with, with a air jacket. All of those are designed to fail safe so that in the event that you lose power, you have some other critical issue that requires the reactor to shut down. Reactor can take itself to a safe state. <clears throat> what you're seeing on the right-hand side are some of the more specifics for our commercial unit. So the heat sinks, the turbine alternator compressor, the secondary loop for the power generation. These components won't be part of the Kaleidos demonstration unit, which is the unit we're taking to dome with the DOE. Uh, but those are the components that allow power generation and, <clears throat> and um, thus fall under NRC, NRC regulation. 
Got some other details on there. I think the other things worth pointing out are uh, that 1.9 megawatt thermal heat output. So overall, the reactor is a 3.5 megawatt thermal, but uh, we're citing 1.9 megawatt thermal for um, for district heating, desalination, other process heat that could be harvested in addition to the uh, electric output. And then the other thing worth pointing out is power down to shippable. We are we are designing to a 30 day max so that when you do reach end of life uh, and you and the reactor requires refueling, it's 30 days from turning off the reactor to being able to transport it over the road, have it in a safe state as far as exposure goes so that uh, we're complying with all regulation there. The other things I guess I'd point out here, uh, sorry, was there a comment? Oh, there was a question, but I'll wait till you get to the end of the slide. Okay. Yeah, um, I see that in the chat. I'll, I'll jump on that in a second. The other thing I'd point out about the benefits of having this all in a single unit is uh, we really want to take advantage of testing in our factory. So uh, part of the manufacturing license, part of all the work we're doing up front is to enable us to manufacture these at scale in a reproducible fashion. We can achieve economies of scale. We can monitor the process more efficiently. Uh, we can really control how these units come out so that instead of building individual units uh, at the site or doing a lot of bespoke work, we're really coming down to the commodification of this micro micro reactor. So by the time it we have tested our factory and delivered it to a customer, there have been no breaks in in primary loops or secondary loops. <clears throat> All the activation testing we've done at the factory is still valid. Uh, we would monitor data on the way to the site. There would be some additional checkouts and testing performed there. Um, but that is uh, one of the key benefits we see from having all of this self-contained. And so I, I see that comment in the chat and I anticipated that um, remote operation monitoring props a question of cybersecurity. Have you developed your cybersecurity strategy yet? And if so, what is it? Uh, I got a similar question at an NRC panel earlier this year. Um, and unfortunately, I have to go back to the comment I made about us as a company uh, growing, being in the early stages of our development. So we're really focused right now on having a product that works. And that is a, a big focus of our plan by going through DOME and through DOE authorization. Um, <clears throat> we're working with DOE. They are, uh, they've are they been an extremely helpful partner in getting through design reviews, in giving us feedback and, uh, and going through an iterative cycle of what does good enough look like? What type of analysis? What type of evidence do we need to provide uh, for our safety basis? For how we come to uh, satisfaction of our principal of our principal design criteria? Um, <clears throat> kind of all a long way of saying we are supremely focused on making the product work, so that by the time we go to our NRC application, we have high quality content um, and certainty that the design works. That means we are putting off uh, some of these discussions, uh, for example, cybersecurity. So we have, uh, we've had initial conversations through pre-application with um, the cybersecurity team at the NRC. We have a few people who have recently joined the team who will be taking that over as their primary responsibility on the regulatory side. Um, maybe to answer more specifically, how do we operate a reactor with a prohibition on wireless? Um, Radiant, as a company, takes a very first principles approach of what is the exact requirement, what is the regulation, and then we build up from there. So um, the regulation can be fairly broad in some aspects, which requires interpretation, which requires pre-application engagement and a lot of discussion, um, but we would anticipate a path where we apply cybersecurity controls that are commensurate with systems that operate today that uh, that pass extremely sensitive material classified content over wireless networks. And so um, maybe the, the shorthand way of saying it is uh, we do plan to operate these remotely and rely on 
uh, rely on connectivity potentially through through a wireless application. Um, but we would work through either a NIST framework or um, <clears throat> cybersecurity controls that are commensurate with those types of systems that has, handle classified uh, classified information and apply those same kind of controls to ensure that we are protecting this data in a similar fashion. So long-winded answer there. Feel free to drop a follow-up in the chat if, uh, if you want to pull on that thread a little bit more. I see another question in the chat. What are your seismic requirements and how do you meet them? Uh, so overall, how we're approaching seismic is we have transportation loads that, that are encompassing of, um, of any seismic event we would anticipate for these applications. So to transport via air, there are user guides that site, um, that site loads and, and environments that by designing the reactor as a whole to accommodate those environments, uh, we would be compliant with, we, we would be able to meet the seismic requirements or environments of any site that we anticipate to operate at or that might drive restrictions on overall where we site these reactors. But uh, maybe a shorter way of saying it is we track environments for this hardware to be, uh, to be transported via air, which is a punishing environment. And then we flow those requirements down to all of those components there. So you see struts, you see framing, uh, you see the, the structure of the reactor itself. Those will be sized with air transport in mind. Assuming Halu correct, that is correct. We will be using uh, we will be using Triso, and we will be using it, the our fuel is Halu. A lot of questions. Uh, so this is exactly what I wanted, uh, and that's why the slide deck is very short. So I'm just going to jump straight to the next one. If an accident should occur with a release to atmosphere such that dose calculations are required, to what extent has the applicability and any limitations of current atmospheric dispersion models deployed in locations subject to extreme and persistent cold conditions been considered as the algorithms and current dispersion models have been based on field studies conducted in the lower 48 states? So we haven't uh, we have not, I don't have that information readily available. If we have applied um, consideration for extreme and persistent cold conditions, um, <clears throat> we have done, we, we have done dispersion analyses, uh, dose consequence analyses as part of our demonstration at Dome. And so uh, there, there's definitely a mix of where we want to be in the future and, and talking about that today to set up um, set up basically the, the work that needs to done needs to be done and uh, citing radiance commitment to do that work um, versus developing those tools, those models and those analyses as we work through dome and initial Kaleidos demonstration unit. And so it's definitely been a helpful <clears throat> roadmap call it for, uh, for getting through these analyses and making sure that we are meeting the Department of Energy's standard uh, to for authorization, obviously that just sets up so, sets us up for more experience, um, and then rolling that over into an NRC application. Not saying that we will be able to satisfy all the criteria right off the bat just coming out of the demonstration of microreactor experiments but that we will have experience with regulators and knowing, um, <clears throat> knowing how to set up those requirements and track, uh, track those requirements in our internal systems uh, and the interactions that we need to have with the regulators on specific timelines where they're gonna have concerns about the design and where we need to bolster those arguments. All right, so with that, I think we can proceed to the next slide. This just provides a bit more of a visual on that regulatory pathway. So DOE authorization is what we're focused on at the moment. Uh, all of our resources are, <clears throat> are taxed with ensuring we submit a quality uh, preliminary design review and draft PDSA. We've got 
demonstration targeted for 2026. So in that time, we need to get through our PDR, submit a draft PDSA, get through final design review, operational readiness review, and our final PDSA. On top of all of that, we are building the hardware, integrating the hardware, and going through testing, building our analysis tools, <clears throat> and developing a body of evidence uh, to support this design. Parallel to that, we are working on our NRC application. We are in the pre-application phase. If you go on the NRC's website, you can see us on the advanced reactor page. Uh, we will be building out our submissions there, starting with our regulatory gap analyses. So this goes back to that comment made earlier about starting from uh, first principles or ground up approach of what is required by law, what is, what is written into the regulation, we focus on the things that we have to meet. There's a, a lot of valuable information on ways to achieve that regulation that is not mandatory, but um, provides higher certainty. Uh, based on our approach, our design, and what we are, um, where we fall, we, we are starting with that grounds up approach of, uh, bottoms up approach of, this is exactly what we need to do to achieve success and, and we're building up from there. So that all starts with the regulatory gap analyses, going through each part of 10 CFR, coming up with a applicable, not applicable, uh, requires either exemption or, <clears throat> or further discussion and really setting the stage for uh, where do we need to focus all of our work uh, and what can we agree in principle does not apply to this type of design. Uh, I think that's very important as we see differences in uh, intent or language for light water reactors versus uh, high temperature gas reactors. I mean, in many places, you will find the word water or light water reactor. And while it may seem that is not applicable because that is not our design, um, without getting that certainty and that confirmation from the regulator, uh, that that would just open us up for greater risk of schedule slip later on as we have to address those questions. So that's where, start, that's where we're starting at with the NRC as we get through our draft PDSA, um, <clears throat> our preliminary documented safety analysis, and we start to complete this body of evidence that would eventually support the application. We plan to turn those into white papers and submit those to the NRC for review so that ahead of an actual application submission, we are getting feedback on this content, uh, but we're doing it in a way so that we are not generating the material outside of an actual test or outside of work being done for the DOE. That is how we're really uh, making best use of our resources to ensure that um, we're leveraging all the work that's done where possible and using real results to help bolster that. Some of those items on that timeline we talked about Kaleidos Development Unit, as well as INL Dome experiment. Uh, later on in that timeline, the 27, 28 timeframe, we are aiming to have our production facility up and running. We are working on selecting a site now. We've got a couple in the couple under consideration. We will need to make a decision later this year, uh, and then we'll move forward with the environmental reviews and permitting required to build that facility. We do plan to do operational testing there, zero power criticality testing. Um, so uh, we'll definitely have a, an operating license required for that facility. And then sometime in 2028 is when we're targeting our first commercial unit. So you can see that timeline, factory environmental assessment, manufacturing license, factory operating license, and then eventually uh, Kaleidos unit operating license. Some of the recent milestones we've completed are, uh, we were added to INL's qualified suppliers list for design services. We are finalizing uh, the rest of the review with them to be added to their qualified supplier list uh, for all services. We completed our conceptual design review and uh, we've been working with them on long lead procurement requests to support the build of our Kaleidos demonstration. Kaleidos development unit. We entered pre-application with the NRC last year formally. Um, we've been engaging with them regularly and uh, more to come there. Um, our safety design strategy was approved by DOE. And so all baby steps on the way to get us to a successful demonstration in 2026 at Dome. 
think we can move on to the next slide now. So here we have our reactor delivery timeline. <clears throat> This assumes a manufacturing license, a, react, a reactor factory operating at rate, so not in the early stages, but as we worked out the production kinks, and, and uh, successful licensing of a few reactors already at this point. So the, the timeline here is not reactors one through five, but reactors five through 50 and beyond. So we fully anticipate that the first couple reactors that are coming out of the factory uh, is a more of a standard traditional review approval process as far as licensing goes. Um, our model is more aimed at, uh, as everyone says, nth of a kind, those uh, optimizations for future state. So our factory is being built and designed with a one reactor a week target, approximately 50 reactors a year. If we're achieving that, we still should not be meeting the demand that's anticipated. Um, but what you're seeing here is, for example, the six weeks from, from that production rate. So order being placed, production scheduling, identifying which reactor that's currently in production would support that, uh, that customer. <clears throat> Week three, your Kaleidos unit is complete. And then weeks four and five, you're getting through factory checkouts, fuel loading, uh, zero power criticality testing, and basically buttoning it up for transport. On the bottom there, those are the site operations that are occurring in parallel, location being identified, verifying that this site conforms with the Kaleidos environmental op, uh, envelope, what the reactor has been, uh, what the reactor has been verified, certified, licensed for, and then uh, minimal land preparation, potentially pouring a bit of concrete, setting up a fence, uh, delivering shielding, and then eventually in week six, delivery and operation. And so I mentioned verifying site conformance with the Kaleidos environmental envelope. This is what we would see as, this entire slide here is what we'd see as an idealized state where the reactor has been certified to meet a specific set of, uh, to be compliant with a specific set of environmental conditions. Uh, sites that we would select and uh, aim to meet this timeline would be sites that fall within the envelope. So this is a brand new site that uh, exceeds exceeds our bounds or or hasn't been analyzed for for various uh, characteristics. We wouldn't be expecting this type of time frame. But also should recognize the fact that um, this is the this is the commoditization of reactor production. In reality, customers are going to be signing contracts. We're going to be uh, getting long advance notice about where these reactors are going to be placed. Um, so I don't expect the pressure actually would be to confirm within two weeks that this customer who we haven't been speaking to uh, has a site that would support this reactor. There's obviously more time for these, but the I think the real intent of this slide is uh, what should be achievable based on uh, reactor production targets um, and agreement on what what makes sense from a from an environmental review. If you have two identical sites and your reactor's been approved for one site, and I mean that in all intents and purposes, identical. Um, what's to say that it, it needs to take a, it needs to take six months, eighteen months? 24 months to, to approve it for the site right next to it. All right, uh, let's go on to the next slide. I see there was a, there was a comment. Yeah, yeah, I think on this, on this slide, um, it, it relates to the last slide and this one. We've got mm -hmm. a couple comments here from Donald. So it says your diagram has a several year period for a factory environmental assessment. However, under a manufacturing license application, the NRC's environmental review is only considering severe accident mitigation design alternatives under 10 CFR 5154. Are you considering a full environmental report that is closer to what would be needed for a COL application at the manufacturing license stage? And then the follow-up was, sounds like you are developing a generic environmental <laughs> report didn't know if you wanted to address that before moving forward. 
Uh, yeah, the second comment sounds like you're developing a generic environmental report. That's accurate. I think uh, a lot of things I've been talking about so far are not new to many people on this call. Um, there's talks about the guys, the generic uh, environmental impact statement. Um, I th This is why I think we feel comfortable presenting this material and and believe in a future where where this is achievable because there there's recognition that uh, a generic environmental report has value for reactors of a specific type and size where where you can claim uh, consistency across units or across sites. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that uh, we're developing one at this moment, but um, that is a that is a future route that we are uh, we are aiming for. Yes, and then your diagram has a several year period for factory environmental assessment. Yeah, so for the manufacturing license, um, <clears throat> that I agree with that statement. Uh, so yes, yes to your question. We are considering our full environmental report needed for a COL application for the manufacturing facility. The clarification being there, um, we do plan to perform zero power testing or criticality testing at the factory. And so we will be seeking a combined operating license for the factory specific to the portion will we, where we will do the testing. And so I think that answers that question or that, that clarifies it. Uh, will the reactor, will the manufacturing license include certification of the reactor as a transport package? This is an interesting question. Um, there, we are currently planning to test the reactor as a package. There's uh, a lot of work um, and change happening as far as uh, transportation. Th this is a this is a topic that the NRC is deeper in consideration than than even us as a developer. And so, like, I'd give credit to uh, the NRC for the ongoing discussion here um, and, and anticipating these needs. So um, we 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 do want to make sure we can re meet the regulation as written. Therefore, the requirements we hold do support the reactor being certified as a package. <clears throat> um, does, it, does it overall in the long term make sense to call the reactor a package when it includes all of the accessory units that support power generation? Um, I, I would say that's no longer a package that is a reactor itself and and we need to think about how we ensure that that can be transported over the road safely if that can be done with the existing regulation that doesn't require exceptions then that's fantastic but i think that's uh an area that's still tbd developers need to bring forth these applications and and try to put a couple of these through the process before we really understand where the holdups are and and where we're going to have problems um but short answer there is we are holding design requirements so that we can test and certify the reactor as a package. And then I see there are a few other questions. What is your reactor's load follow capability? Uh, so our reactor can throttle from 30% to 100%. We are writing the software uh, for, uh, for reactivity control um, to, with load following in mind. Uh, so we, the the intent there would would be that we do not have to have an operator in the loop to um, to enable load following. There are challenges there with remote operations and uh, who performs those actions. Fully recognize that, but um, maybe that answers the question. We do have the capability to throttle between thirty percent and one hundred percent load. Under the Envision business model, will Radiant be something like an IPP? And I'd have to, um, I'd, I'd have to second Ronnie's question. Uh, can you define IPP for me, please? It's a uh, independent power producer. <clears throat> that is a challenging one to answer. I think it all depends on our customers and and what their needs will be. So we will be. Uh, we will be flexible and responsive to how customers want to um, want to arrange these agreements. So, 
I don't have a lot of information I can provide or answer author authoritatively on that subject. Um, but I guess overall, I would say Radiant will build reactors, uh, and we anticipate we anticipate being the license holder for uh, potentially being the license holder for these operating units. Um, but we are, are flexible on structuring those in the way that best makes sense for the regulator, for Radiant, and for the customer. I can't. Hey, Johnson, I'll, I'll keep uh, track of these. If you want to move on to the next one, then uh, we, I can make sure that we uh, get to them at the end. Sounds good. Yeah, I'll try to go through the next slides kind of quick. I see we're getting a bit short on time. Uh, so the published timeline here, this is uh, just summarizing the overall timeline from the material available and the the expected time frame for an environmental review um, and then eventual decision and commencement of operations. Highlighted below that, talked about on the previous slide, is the overall timeline where we think we could deploy a reactor um, and, and thus, you know, citing the 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 difference in overall length for these two processes. If we move on to the next slide, we can highlight a few of the instances where we think it's important to try to tackle this subject. So microreactors as an alternative to diesel generators, we see two very good applications in both natural disasters uh, and for defense applications. And natural disaster scenarios such as a wildfire, a uh, hurricane, or uh, extreme heat scenario, you are looking for immediate relief to that loss of power. Um, those, <clears throat> those scenarios onset immediately. You have little to no indication uh, of when those will occur. And when they do occur, uh, the, the desire to rectify that situation is immediate. <clears throat> for military applications, the, this is why the reactor is designed to be transportable. Uh, you, the reactor could serve the same purpose as what um, what Project Pele is aimed to do. That was an inspiration for us as a company um, to be able to support remote locations, uh, eliminate refueling and, and the issues uh, and danger that comes along with that, and be easily transported to, to move along with, uh, with the troops, with the deployed units. So if we go on to the next slide, pointing out some of those challenges for prescriptive requirements in each of these applications, um, for natural disasters, you, you have uh, a need for speed. You, there is potential desalination requirements if your infrastructure is really at risk, uh, powering hospitals to respond to injuries, uh, potentially supporting rescue activities. Impacts of construction in these scenarios is uh, much, much lower on the list, for example, um, Fugitive dust from a construction site probably is not much of a concern when, uh, when you have a lot greater debris and concern in the area. <clears throat> and um, the no alternative uh, of either not having power uh, or potentially using a diesel generator and, and providing the harmful effects of um, emissions and, and increased carcinogens uh, that's obviously a, a factor that's worth mitigating. For military installations, kind of a similar scenario there. You want to quickly establish power. Uh, it could be a temporary use, but the, the mission for a defense versus a civil endeavor uh, is fundamentally different. And rather than a power alternative or a clean power, what you're looking for is reliable power. And again, um, Construction noise or sight lines in those types of scenarios uh, are, are not the same considerations. So if we go on to the next slide. I believe this is the last one, which will help us wrap up. Uh, and here we're, we're at the summary. Uh, so what you didn't see here was a great proposal on how to implement a risk-informed process that is compliant with either the existing regulatory framework or shows us how to get there, but I did want to highlight the need and why these approaches are important. So we do have a lot of work to do. Uh, we do want to focus on these types of solutions for our nth of a kind reactors, uh, and we just want to make sure that we know what the pathway look, or we know what the endpoint looks like. So as we plan out the pathway, uh, we can proceed with that in mind. 
to bring it back to the risk informed approach and uh, how we link those things together. There, there are needs and situations for prescriptive requirements. Um, there are opportunities for improvement when a risk informed approach uh, makes better sense, such as evaluating the, the risk, the intents and the motivations of the applications like we saw earlier on the disaster recovery or the military application slides. Um, and one that, um, <clears throat> one that uh, I think we hear time and time again, requirements for mandatory meetings or mandatory hearings, timeframes that uh, may be required from a statutory perspective, but uh, no longer serve the purpose of, of the current applications. So I went through all of that very quickly, but uh, that is the final slide. And I think at this point we can approach any of the questions that have been piling up. So Brandon, I'll look to you. Yeah, so I think the first one that is most related to the environmental discussion, are you applying COL ISG 029 entitled Environmental Considerations Associated with Microreactors, and there's an Adams ML number in the chat, uh, in support of your generic ER? Uh, I can't say today we are doing that, um, but it's worth looking at, and I will copy that ML number down for future reference. Okay, and then we did just get another um, question about environmental conditions. Has Radiant looked at the environmental conditions they would be looking to use to make a similarity or bounding evaluation from the generic environmental evaluation to a specific site? Uh, we have not looked at that yet. It's on the docket for uh, work to be done in the future. So then we've got a couple of questions about details on the reactor and in the presentation. So if a reactor should trip for whatever reason, how do you get it restarted and how do you supply replacement power until you get the reactor operating again? Yeah, so uh, those will need to be uh, specified for, for each site as far as shore power um, or are we going to rely on, on, on battery power for those applications. So the, the reactor uh, will come with a battery and that is what we'll rely on for initial startup. Um, the reactor is, the reactor would be designed to fail into a safe state, but not a powerless state. So we do need to size the batteries with that in consideration. Uh, like how many spurious trips do we anticipate? If the reactor were to shut itself down due to a more serious event, um, that is something where we would either need to send out on-site diagnostic. Uh, we could patch in with a diagnostic port and understand what's going on with the reactor and diagnose, is this something we should bring back to the factory? Is this something we can rectify in the field? Um, but some of these, especially the early applications, wouldn't expect that our first reactor is going to go to a remote location without auxiliary power. Uh, it's more likely operating in a, in a backup sense or um, as a way to provide uh, a base load as opposed to primary power. Okay, and then Pat, if you could back up three slides from here, this is a pretty simple one, and then we'll get back to a follow-up on the atmospheric dispersion. Oop, one more forward, sorry. Um, the question here is, uh, what are the rectangular boxes with the forklift on the military application slide? And I think it's yeah. one more forward. Those are graphical representation of modular shielding. So in some instances, we may have uh, poured concrete in temporary locations. We could, uh, we could use transportable shielding that is not purpose-built for that location, but is more modular, potentially thicker, um, difficult to move around, but where you have a temporary setup with the equipment necessary because you're supporting a base, uh, that would be a viable solution. Okay, and this one is a little bit longer. This is a follow-up to the previous atmospheric dispersion question. So should a release occur, what would its temperature relative to ambient temperature conditions be? If relatively hot, rise of the plume could change to downwind distance where the maximum impact is expected to occur rather than at the site boundary. Uh, that is, I, I don't have the temperature off the top of my head, but plume analysis um, and 
uh, and effects based on on wind and meteorological conditions are part of our model. Um, it is something that we look at. I don't have a straightforward answer on what the temperature would be. Okay, and then uh, I'll just read here. Uh, Travis said, always good to see solutions taking advantage of our decades of nuclear powered emergency Emergency power that the Navy provides, one reactor per submarine capable of providing back feed onto the shore. Uh, very short response times, great capability to have. Well done. Uh, okay, another question. You, Does Radiant foresee tools like the Advanced Non-Light Water Reactor, PRA Standard, helping to provide a basis for more expedited environmental reviews and or reductions in environmental impact scope? For example, taking advantage of those risk insights. So, uh, Radiant, we definitely want to take advantage of the work that's been done before. Um, <clears throat> and the I, I can't say I'm familiar with the advanced night law, advanced non light water reactor PRA. Um, the approach of using a PRA. Um, and developing that for our application uh, or using the tools that exist. Yes, definitely makes sense. Although, Travis, I can't give you um, a, a more detailed answer than that. Sorry, I'm going to have to leave it there. And then a uh, question here, what kind of fuel will you use? Pell bed reactor, prismatic fuel? Yeah, we'll be using triso fuel. And we will be loading that into compacts, uh, and that's probably all I'm able to say right now. And so then I've actually got a question of my own. You talked mostly about environmental during this presentation. Uh, what, I, I guess, are there other areas that you are looking within your application or your licensing basis to risk inform or to move more towards performance based? principles? Uh, if so, you know, what are the other kind of high priority areas that are on your mind right now? Definitely. It was hard selecting a topic for this because there are so many. Uh, one that was touched on in the discussion is cybersecurity. We, there's a lot of reference to prohibition on wireless, which in 10 CFR, I don't believe the word wireless is actually used, uh, which a uh, believe sets us up for the opportunity to make a case for why we should be able to operate these reactors remotely. Um, so in that sense, I, I see very much uh, a risk-informed approach where the consequences uh, of, of a security event compared to consequences in other arenas where we already use wireless um, is lower and is acceptable in those other areas. Uh, so for cybersecurity, for sure, we'll take a risk a uh, risk-informed approach with remote operations, number of operators, the number of reactors we will have and how we will operate them uh, will far outstrip the number of operators we will be able to train to operate those reactors. So that will be another area. Um, there are many others that I could pull up and, and read off, but I, I think that gives you a good sense. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I don't see any more. So I'll give, I'll ask one more question and then I'll give folks a chance if they have any last minute questions that they want to ask. And, and this is coming a little bit from my uh, lack of experience in the environmental area. Um, so I was wondering with the, the EIS, is that scope the way that you envision it, especially given the, the small and distributed nature of your reactors? Is that scope per reactor or is that per site? Um, I guess I was just wondering, does the fact that you might, you know, you might deploy these, you know, kind of scattered out through, you know, a, a varying so uh, area of land, does that like challenge the traditional concept of what a nuclear site looks like? Uh, so if I'm understanding your question correctly, I, I, I think the way to answer that is the regulation tells me today that we need to perform an environmental assessment for every reactor we deploy. Uh, we, anticipate, we anticipate building and qualifying a reactor to a, let's call it a maximum condition or a worst case scenario, hypothetical site that doesn't exist that has uh, all the worst 
geological uh, geological meteorological features you could think of um, showing that if we meet those requirements and any site that we identify falls within those bounds, uh, then the reactor should be able to, um, we should be able to cite that reactor with a, a minimal set of, of review or verification. So showing that we're within those bounds, getting confirmation that uh, that is true and accurate and recognizing that any additional work beyond um, beyond that review is is not adding value at that point. Um, so like I, I want to be careful with that statement and say, if the work that's being done, everyone agrees that it's unnecessary based on the data that's shown so far, um, then we shouldn't have to perform that work. Okay, yeah, thanks. So we got uh, one comment and then one last question, then I'll turn it back over to, to either to Pat or Prasad. So uh, comment here, the NRC encourages pre-application discussions on our environmental guidance to consider items you presented, especially discussions on areas of NRC consultation, such as the Endangered Species Act. And then uh, one more question, uh, just to confirm that the envisioned operations model is a fleet of reactors that are remotely operated from a centralized control room, whether that be regionally or nationally. I can confirm that. That is correct. All right. We're all caught up on the chat. So uh, Pat or Prasad, uh, I'll turn it, well, I can turn it back over to y'all. Thanks, Brandon. I, I, I guess I'd like to uh, take the available few minutes to ask a question myself. Um, you know, from everything you said, Chanson, uh, about evidence-based application for a license, it seems to me that what you're talking about is a formal performance-based uh, approach uh, that will drive the, uh, the application. Now, uh, you know, uh, some people associate a, a formal performance-based approach with uh, uh, making a safety case. Now, uh, what I have heard is that a formal safety case uh, to be made uh, requires three things. Uh, it requires a claim to be made. It uh, requires the arguments why that claim is supportable. And the third is the evidence that uh, you show that the claim will be fulfilled. Um, do you foresee that, uh, you know, because you're relying essentially on the performance-based nature of a lot of our regulations, uh, that you will uh, employ a formal performance-based approach for your application? <clears throat> for the first application, uh, I don't see that being the case. What we want to make sure we do is demonstrate that the technology works through our DOE authorization and experiment, uh, and then show that the technology can be licensed through our manufacturing license, the initial operating license, and, and the first couple units. Um, Everything else beyond that, I, I think we take lessons from pre-application requests for additional information and the eventual application review process, uh, and then decide for our follow-up applications um, what is the best approach to streamline those. So I might be a, a bit preemptive to, to commit to that approach, but hopefully that, that makes it clear what we will do for the first few applications. Okay, well, I, I, I do think that um, what you're offering is an opportunity for NRC to exercise a performance-based uh, approach for its regulations. And, um, you know, having uh, uh, all the questions answered, uh, you know, I really appreciate uh, your presentation and, you know, and all the people uh, participating in this. Uh, uh, and I want to thank your company for, uh, you know, uh, contributing to our effort uh, 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 for the RIPB repository, as it were. So, uh, Pat, I think uh, uh, we can uh, close this uh, 
session of the community of practice. Thank you again, Chancel. Appreciate your presentation very much. Thanks for having us. Thank you all. Have a great weekend. Bye. Bye.